Good morning, everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful, restful weekend um, and are ready to talk all things RTD today. Um, uh, we are going to call this meeting to order um, just so that the public's aware. We're having some technical difficulties with getting some of our committee members to join. Um, so uh, there are a couple um, that are uh, you know, in, in process of working out some of those issues. So um, we should have a few more folks join us, um, but they have been present since uh, before we started this meeting. Just wanted to make a note for the public there. Um, and um, speaking of the public, let's uh, transition to public comment. Do we have anyone on the public comment line? All right, uh, Madam Chair, I will go ahead and open up uh, the phone lines first. And if there's anyone on the phones, if you could please hit star six now, unmute yourself and state your name. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone for the phones. And uh, at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Okay. Okay. Give it a couple seconds. I'm not hearing anyone either, oh. so. Sorry, I did see a hand uh, that just went up. So uh, it looks like we have a question or comment from uh, John Percy. Uh, you will have three minutes, and then at the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to make your closing comment. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and, and hello, everyone. Um, first time talker, long time listener. Um, I want to follow up on Elise's and Crystal's presentation to the RTD Planning Committee uh, last week. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, just a point of clarification on the parking point. Um, uh, I, I should say, uh, John Hersey, Denver resident, uh, former RTD staff uh, lead of the parking report that Elise referenced in the planning committee. Um, the, the RTD planning committee has proposed to amend uh, revised statute 32 9 119 8 uh, section 4, removing reference to the law's requirements for transit oriented development to provide adequate parking. Um, my, my point is just that neither the enabling legislation under scrutiny uh, nor the RTD policy, any RTD policy, defines adequate parking, quote unquote. Um, so adequate parking uh, cannot and does not inhibit redevelopment of agency property today. Uh, it, this seems like finding a solution where there isn't a problem. Uh, instead, there, there, are, there are issues that do limit TOD that uh, the committee may want to address, uh, including local zoning limitations, uh, including uh, high minimum parking requirements, as well as high infrastructure costs uh, to transform former industrial property to support the mixed use development that the committee and many others would like to see around RTD stations. Uh, well, while the proposed change to the legislation likely will not harm RTD in any way, uh, it suggests that the adequate parking, quote unquote, adequate parking, as a problem in the first place and uh, serves to distract from the real challenges of meeting the committee's well-intended ends for greater transit-oriented development in Metro Denver. Um, that's, that's the extent of my comment. Um, thank you all for your service. And thank you for your input. Do we have anyone else online? Uh, at this time, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, wonderful. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to make a comment on, on that last piece. Um, and I think Elise did as well, so I'll make it brief so we can both um, opine on that. But um, as it relates to the, the part around um, amending local zoning, uh, local zoning uh, ordinances, um, that is indeed part of the I guess conversation, but we have no, you know, especially when it comes to home rule cities, we have no jurisdiction over uh, changing um, those laws. But um, you know, certainly uh, have been part of conversations, and perhaps in, down the line we, you know, consider other, you know, like a, you know, city toolkit that kind of implements some of these things. But um, just wanted to comment there. At least I saw that your hand also went up. Uh, yeah, two things. Uh, Lynn Geisinger is still trying to get in. She just texted me. Um, and then with regards to one of the provisions in our recommended um, legislative recommendations is to um, 
make RTD exempt from local uh, zoning with regards to parking, which would address the commenter's point about um, those uh, those requirements provide uh, serving as a burden now. And I know of one example, and I think it's probably um, a mixture of local zoning and RTD's way of doing business with regards to um, protecting so much surface um, parking in recognition that we probably don't need as much parking at parking rides as, as we think, particularly if we're able to do TOD around affordable housing, um, that parking could be smaller or a, a smaller magnitude than, than currently thought. And the RTD parking study that was just done in December bears that out. So while our legislative recommendations aren't going to solve it, everything, it does attempt to address um, not requiring RTD to have to uh, deal with local parking requirements. Thanks, Elise, for those additional comments. Um, yes, Rhett. I, I want to make the point that our goal here is to provide uh, RTD with better control over parking and the parking decisions. And uh, I read, you know, I, I read parts of that uh, parking report and, and really felt like it, it really did a good job of laying out what, uh, where RTD is right now. And, and uh, I think in the end, if it, if it passes, it doesn't, it doesn't constrain RTD. It, it gives RTD greater flexibility and control over those decisions. And again, these are recommendations to RTD. They're not things RTD necessarily has to abide by uh, and, and uh, support. But uh, the, the broader idea is, is greater flexibility for RTD. Thanks. OK, so let's move on uh, to our co-chair report. Uh, this is a new agenda item. Um, if you're not familiar with seeing that, it's just an opportunity for us to communicate um, updates, I believe. Um, the only update we have is that uh, tomorrow, uh, the 9th, the, ninth, um, the Northwest Trail is on the agenda for the RTD board study session. Um, so just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Um, Troy, I don't know if you wanted to add any additional commentary there. None needed. It should be very interesting and uh, be very helpful to new board members and general public and obviously this panel as well. Thank you. Okay, and then to my co-chair. Thanks. I just wanted to let folks know that Crystal and I are responding to all requests for presentations on the interim report, and we've gotten several. We've made presentations to the governor, to the uh, joint meeting of the House and Senate Transportation Committees. Um, to the RTD board, and then just on Friday, the, the Denver Streets Partnership. So um, um, collecting feedback and input and trying to spread the word as we go. Um, and we, because we can foresee a time where there may be um, a large volume of presentation requests, we're also exploring the idea of housing um, our PowerPoint um, on the Dr. Cog website so that folks can kind of just get a glance of what we've been working on um, as opposed to reading the, the full interim report, although, you know, that is probably the best way to get that information, but um, just an FYI on that as well. All right, um, next agenda item is the January 11th um, meeting summary. Has everyone had a chance to review that? And um, remind me, do we take a formal vote on this? No? Okay. Is this like a yet head nod situation? Okay. Uh, is, is everyone reviewed and is everyone okay with that meeting summary? Thumbs up, heads. Okay, great. Head nods. Wonderful. Thank you all for your participation. <laughs> uh, um, and Next is our subcommittee reports. Uh, let's start with Brett uh, with the finance subcommittee. And Brett, you are muted. How about now? <laughs> Great. 
On our January 20th meeting, we received a summary of the 2021 federal COVID relief funding and its planned use so far from Deborah Johnson and acting CFO Doug McLeod. The committee discussed working on some early recommendations uh, and CEO Johnson indicated that she would welcome these ideas. Uh, we reviewed RTD's debt and interest obligations and their impact on RTD's ability to complete the remaining fast tracks unfinished corridors. Finally, we reviewed a draft schedule of outstanding work goals for the committee and how we might complete these by May 2021. On our February 3rd meeting, we received an update on final 2021 COVID relief funding. We then reviewed, discussed, amended, and approved eight RTD recommendations for potential uses of COVID funding, as well as some additional recommendations related to our work goals. We also reviewed equity assessments on all eight recommendations. These recommendations will be discussed at today's RTD Accountability Committee meeting. We also finalized our work plan for our goals to be completed by the end of May. Thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Brett. Um, governance Subcommittee with Julie. All right, thank you so much. So um, our previous meetings have um, continued to uh, further the conversation around the local service councils. Um, we had a presentation on travel sheds and we thought that would be a really interesting way of kind of subdividing these service councils. Um, originally, we were thinking about um, kind of modeling after the previous tip forums that took place, which are more county specific, but looking at this travel shed data um, seems like a really good opportunity um, to distribute the councils that way. Um, on our last meeting, we also had a conversation um, just reviewing uh, the meeting that happened on January 29th, which was our second round table with the local technical staff um, and getting their feedback. Um, I think that these meetings have been really helpful um, to get these folks and their opinions um, raised up. And so those have been really helpful meetings for us just to, to understand um, their perspective of the local service council um, idea. Um, moving forward, we are trying to um, kind of wrap up the service council conversation um, and we'll be moving on to um, the conversation of partnerships um, here in the next week or so. So thanks. And thank you for keeping the ball rolling. I know we have a lot to get through before the end of this committee. Um, and I will pass it off to Dea to give an operations subcommittee update. Hi, thank you. Um, so at the January 20th meeting for the operations committee, um, we engaged in, this, in a discussion with the Auraria campus as well as Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, CCDC, um, around service delivery, at the intersection of fares as well as user experience and how folks are um, getting on and off of the RTD system. Uh, the conversation on service delivery and the experience of folks with disabilities um, really transitioned into our February 3rd meeting with a presentation by Kristen Trustman, a member of this committee. Um, we also spent the majority of our time on February 3rd receiving an update um, on the state auditor's report um, specifically looking at worker conditions and just what current operators and drivers are experiencing in terms of um, providing services on RTD. Uh, we will move into the next meeting uh, with a update on the fare box recovery ratio, which was also covered in the state auditor's report. Okay, um, if anyone hasn't had a chance to read through that, there's a lot of good information. I, I was really surprised to um, to hear their thoughts on the fare box recovery ratio um, as well, um, or specifically from that report. Um, let's see. Want me to take it over from here? Um, yeah, and then actually just one comment before uh, we do that. So we just for a little bit of context, we had a conversation around um, the physical structure of, of the buses um, at our operations subcommittee. Um, 
team, how, how do you want to handle when we receive additional input that wasn't discussed in those public meetings? Because I would imagine that there's going to be some input at, at some point in you know, all of these conversations that doesn't quite get captured in these public recordings and these public conversations, but um, to some degree we'd want to get incorporated into our final report. Um, how have committee chairs or how, you know, do we have a process for um, incorporating that additional feedback? You know, I'm wondering whether or not there shouldn't be some sort of appendix to our final report that's the compilation of and summarizing the feedback that we've gotten in all the different various forums um, since one of our requirements is to do public outreach. I don't know if Ron or Matthew or Doug might respond to the feasibility of that. Elise, this is Doug. I'll, I'll speak up. Um, at least you cut out a little bit. Can you can you just repeat what you said? I'm sorry. Sure. I just wondered whether or not an appendix to our final report it could be a compilation of the public input that we've received along the way throughout this whole process. Um, it doesn't have to be verbatim everything, but at least a summary of of the the input because one of the charges to our committee is doing public outreach. So I was of just course, wondering yeah. if that would be a way to capture that. Definitely, that sounds good. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone really opposed to that. So we can we can continue the conversation, but I think that um, at a minimum, that could be something that we uh, incorporate there. So uh, Rebecca, did do you want to add something? Sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you're just coming on camera to, to speak or otherwise, apologies. Um, and Elise, I will uh, let you take it away. I thought I saw Dea's hand up. Oh, I'm I'm sorry about that. Dea, what's up? No, that's okay. I, I guess I just have a quick point of clarification in, in what you may be asking, Crystal. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. Are we asking how we want to incorporate um, specific feedback into our report that may be outside of the scope of this committee, or is it specifically if we receive feedback that's related to something within the report itself or within the recommendations of this committee? Yeah, more, more the latter. Um, just, uh, you know, I, there's, we have that really robust conversation, but then we gotta move on, right? Because we just have to get through our agenda. So just making sure um, if folks have already been receiving feedback and input that we have a process to be able to capture that, if not discussed at some point in, in the conversation. So yes. Okay. Anyone else on that one? Okay. I think you're good to go, Elise. Great. Um, I just wanted to check in on whether or not we've been able to get any progress in getting Lynn on the call. I know we're having technical difficulties, but any of the Dr. Cog staff, do we? Board, board yeah. Director Geisinger is is on. Um, is. Mayor, Mayor Malay is. Um, we still haven't been able to bring her over as a panelist. However, she she she's able to um, unmute herself if she needs to talk. Okay, I just got what? another. Text hey, yeah, watch watch out! I'm here. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think. Usually, Lynn it's has really obvious that. when you're here. I just got a text from Lynn that said, oh, there, there she is. Okay. There she is. Excellent. All right. Well, so just moving along um, on our agenda, we have a an update um, on RTED's use of CRISA funding. Um, Ron, are you kicking this off or are we going straight to RTD? Um, Co-Chair Jones, I believe we're going straight to um, uh, Deborah Johnson and Doug McLeod. Wonderful. Take it away. All right. Good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I don't know if you're in possession of our presentation, or Doug, do you have it? Yes, I do. It was um, it was set out in a link, so hopefully somebody can bring it up. I'm not sure to sh how to share on uh, GoTo, so if somebody could walk me through that, I've got it ready to pull up. 
Sure, I can help you out with that. Um, so I will go ahead and make you the presenter now, and then there should be something that pops up on your screen designating you as the presenter. Great, thank you. Thanks, Doug. We're tag teaming, Guess I guess you guys figure that out. <laughs> All right, I got the email to show my screen, so let's try this. There it is. You see it? Oh, fantastic. <clears throat> All righty, so good morning all. Once again, I'm Deborah Johnson, the General Manager and CEO at RTD, and I'll be joined this morning by Doug McLeod, our Acting Chief Financial Officer. And what we wanted to do this morning was just briefly orient you to our plans thus far in reference to utilizing the Coronavirus Response and, Re and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, affectionately known as CARISA. So if you could go to the next slide, Doug. So just to give you a little background, uh, and most of you are familiar with this, um, this is our second round of stimulus funding that the agency will use to support the continuity of transit services. The first being, of course, the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act really aided RTD in sustaining its workforce throughout the calendar year of 2020. In November of last year, RTD's uh, 2021 budget was approved by the RTD board which addressed a $140 million deficit. Measures taken to address the deficit included budget reductions that, including, that included, excuse me, decreasing the agency workforce, implementing furloughs for non-salaried, um, uh, I meant to say salaried non-representative employees, it's Monday morning, forgive me, as well as leveraging funds through the CARES Act, which I just mentioned. Um, the employee impacted budgetary measures, including the reduction in force, was effectuated on January 10th. If you could go to the next slide, Doug. The following day on January 11th, RTD received notice of its CARISA apportionment. And Doug will talk more uh, specifically about how we're utilizing um, or identify the fund the funding allocations but what i want to spend time on is talking right now what rtd intends to do so um considering uh, the intent of the CRISA funds my top priority here has been to restore the agency's workforce and the rtd operations team has worked cooperatively with the union over the past few weeks to call all full-time frontline operations employees who were laid off as part of the reductions those callbacks have concluded. Um, the team began last week the process of recalling part-time bus operators. Um, the CARISA funding utilization plan will vastly be used for the restoration of service and will be leveraged incrementally per service change. Now, just for your orientation, the agency has three service changes per year, January, May, and September. And the plan includes the full roll-up of designated service hours. And what that really means is that the ad back of service will be based upon data and feedback. Um, staff, we're constantly reviewing data that comes from our automatic passenger counters, street supervisory observations, customer stakeholders, as well as operator feedback in determining where the additional services um, and resources need to be allocated. So for instance, when I talk about full roll up, I'm saying like deploying additional vehicles in response to overloads for current COVID level service, recognizing current social distancing protocols, school trippers based on return to in-class instruction, covering open runs based on operator availability, um, and then more specifically salaried non-representative employees. Um, they've endured compensation impacts in 2020 through nine mandated furlough days and we're primed to endure additional impacts in 2021. But what I wanna to talk to you about right now is how we're going to, uh, what I mean by the, the full aspect of the roll-ups. So what that means is the mechanics time to ensure that a vehicle is in a state of good repair for pullout, the fleet supervisor who oversees this work, the service and cleaning employees and supervisors who are ensuring the vehicle is property, properly sanitized and clean, the dispatcher who's ensuring the proper vehicle is assigned to the right block and run, the operator who's ensuring that essential workers get to their essential jobs, 
and the street supervisor who is basically overseeing street operations and ensuring uh, that we are making good on our commitment to get our customers where they need to go when they need to get there. Additionally, um, we have allocated monies uh, or set aside monies pertaining to the state audit, which was referenced earlier and uh, one of the committee reports in which we have two critical areas in which we have a laser focus, one of which is RTD's internal audit function. Uh, we recently commissioned um, a peer review through the American Public Transportation Association. Uh, we plan to get that underway in March. Those recommendations coming from that effort will inform the agency's decisions as we go forward. As it relates to the operations side of the house, the vast majority of the state audit focused on um, some aspects regarding bus and light rail operator attrition, frontline operation supervisory practices, operator rest breaks, and shift scheduling. Our first step is to work with peer agencies um, additionally, the National Transit Institute at Rutgers and APTA to identify best practices, including but not limited to like emotional intelligence, leveraging a robust recruitment process, as well as run cutting and leveraging our extra board. And moreover, we have identified in that same pot of money that I referenced, monies to be leveraged for accountability committee recommendations. So now I want to turn it over to Doug, who can speak more specifically about the process as relates to FTA and how we internally came up with those specific allocations. So Doug, take it away. Great. Thank you, Deborah. And I had clicked and unclicked my mute button. So can everybody still see the presentation? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. My screen did something kind of strange there. All right, great, thank you, Deborah. So, um, so as Deborah mentioned, there's $203 million in this CRISA funding, and uh, we've broken that down um, between or amongst some um, uses that we envision as uh, spending this money on over the next uh, period of time. The CRISA funding, um, we are waiting, awaiting the FTA to give specific guidance on that money. Um, however, we do intend to draw that money down as quickly as possible, even though the use of it will be spread out over a, a period of time, which I'll discuss here shortly. Um, as far as the, what we're, our expectations are for expenditures, so this is a reimbursement grant, just like the CARES grant. It's very similar to the CARES grant in that uh, we would need to spend, make the expenditures first, then draw the funds afterwards. So if you'll recall on the CARES grant, uh, all of our draws were based on uh, wages and benefits for salary not, and as well as represented and the associated benefits, as well as purchase transportation. And purchase transportation is the, are the funds that we spend uh, with our contractors that provide fixed route services, ADA, et cetera. However, we only drew, uh, drew funds on uh, fixed route, including uh, bus and rail. So the breakdown of that 200 million is the first bullet point we show here is 180 million. So that's just shy of 90% of the funding would go towards operations. And as I mentioned, we will draw that funding down based on our ongoing expenditures as soon as that uh, the funding is available. However, we intend to stretch that funding from the CRISA funds over a two-year period. Deborah mentioned that we have three run boards each year, uh, January, May, and September. So what we'd like to do is rather than spending all that money uh, right away, we'd like to make it last. So we've designated $180 million that we would uh, stretch over six run boards. So that's, those six run boards would be two years starting with uh, the June 13th run board that we plan to enact. So basically that $30 million, what we would do is we, we say we can add an additional um, $30 million from the level that we're at at the 40% reduced service level. We go up 30 million and then we could stay at that level for six run boards uh, going out using 180 million. Uh, the second bullet point is uh, we have $4.4 .4 million that um, we realized that when the uh, internal COVID task force was coming up with uh, expense reductions going forward to uh, offset that $140 million budget shortfall on our revenues. We had taken out overtime and extra shift pay, um, except for we left overtime in that was scheduled for our operators to run their, um, their shifts. 
So we mistakenly took out $4.4 million. We need to restore that in order to provide our services because we have dispatchers, street supervisors, uh, many other positions besides operators that need to incur that overtime and extra shift pay in order to keep our operations running effectively. The third bullet is $1.7 million. Um, so along with uh, the restoration of um, uh, positions, bringing back full-timers and part-timers, we also wanted to address um, some of the non-represented uh, pay cuts. So these would be salaried employees. Uh, in 2020, uh, salaried employees took nine furlough days. And in 2021, we had planned on those employees taking another six furlough days. Uh, the cost of eliminating those six furlough days would be to increase the budget by $1.7 million in 2021. Uh, last bullet point we show on this page, $887,000. Uh, we had planned uh, salary tiered salary reductions for 2021 in addition to the furloughs. Uh, so those two bullet points kind of go together in order to, um, you know, the uh, we, we eliminate a lot of um, additional benefit costs to the company. Um, so those employees are still, the non-represented employees are still bearing the burden of those, including uh, reducing um, the defined contribution Retirement plan from 9% to 7%. There's other uh, smaller um, costs that those non-represented employees are bearing, including uh, higher uh, premium costs on their uh, on their health care, as well as some el elimination of some smaller items um, such as just things to, that we normally do, uh, travel, etc. Um, so the combination of the 1.7 and the 886 are intended to um, restore some of the um, cost cuts that we had planned for non-represented employees in 2021. Uh, last two bullet items, $2.4 million was the cost to restore um, the opportunity for non-represented staff to sell their excess PTO vacation and sick balances. RTD has had a policy in place where um, employees, if they reach a certain level of PTO, sick or vacation balances, they can send the, sell those balances back twice uh, during the year in prior years. That was eliminated in 2021 as part of the COVID task force cost saving opportunities. However, it's really not a cost savings to RTD because RTD would still owe those balances to those employees should they leave. So it was really look at, looking at it more of a, a cash uh, preservation item, knowing that we had $140 million shortfall. So um, knowing that that is really still due to the employees um, and we would have to pay it back, uh, we made the decision to allow those employees to do a one-time sell back of up to 80 hours. Um, part of the problem that we were running into with the non-represented employees on that was that many people were losing um, their, their vacation PTO and sick balances because they were more senior and they had large balances. With the furloughs that were in place in 2020, many of the the employees weren't able to take their vacation, take their sick time, et cetera. Um, so th that really goes to restore that ability for employees to get the benefit of uh, what they've actually earned. And then finally, um, there's approximately four to just under $14 million left over um, that hasn't been necessarily designated for specific uses. However, we have that balance remaining. As you can see here, we've designated at, as um, to be used as needed for measures taken uh, from recommendations from the accountability committee as well as the state performance audit. And that is the end of the presentation. Deborah, would you like to make any other comments? Oh, thank you very much, Doug, and thanks for sharing that with everybody. I would just say we're happy to answer or clarify any information that was presented, so thank you. All right, thank you, Deborah and Doug. If you could stop sharing your screen so we could see everybody, we'll see if there's any questions from committee members. All right. I think I stopped answering. Okay. You did uh, Rebecca? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, just just to confirm my understanding, so all these um, cuts were that are now being restored were all associated with the COVID impact and not part of any sort of larger long-term cost reductions RTD was, was making just, just due to other financial issues.
Yes, this is uh, correct. Um, that that's true. These were all taken as measures um, when we had the 140 million dollar uh, shortfall forecasted for 2021. Um, we needed to reduce costs um, to offset that, and so uh, part of that was the big part of that was layoffs, um, as well as all these other measures that were taken. Um, service reductions, I guess, service reductions and layoffs were the biggest chunk of offsetting that 140 million dollars. We also um, did all these other measures, including furloughs, pay cuts, etc. So yeah, it was all as a result of um, of the COVID impact to our our budget. Brett. Can't hear you. Okay. Um, you my question is about the 2022 budget. Uh, if we don't continue to receive this, you know, $200 million plus of funding uh, from the federal government, then uh, what kind of, given that we're eliminating all of these cost reductions that we've done, what are we faced with uh, for that future uh, budget? Has that been? planned into this? Is there an anticipated 2022 significant deficit that we need to find ways to, to uh, minimize? So right now, uh, when we did our last midterm financial plan, which is a six-year plan, uh, the board of directors approved only two years of that plan, 2021 and 2022. In those two years, we felt that um, we were in decent shape. Um, we still have issues on fast tracks going out um, because of the cost reduction measures we had taken. Um, we thought, we think that 2022 will be okay, especially with us stretching these CRISA funds out, uh, six run boards, which would go into 2022. What we don't know at this point is we're still cl closing out 2021, sorry, 2020 financials um we're going through the audit and need to see kind of where our reserve balances are and reforecast our sales taxes that will be the critical point but i think through 2022 we're in decent sh shape to where we won't have to take huge measures keep in mind that one of the big things that we did um, in addition to service reductions payroll reductions um, layoffs we delayed a whole bunch of um, capital projects and state of good repair projects so in 2021 2021, we have virtually no spending for that. We've pushed it out just one year. Uh, so we'll need to be doing some catch up at some point with that. And that assumes a recovery, an economic recovery and an increase in sales tax revenues for 2022? Correct, the most recent sales tax forecast that we got from uh, CU Leads that does our forecasting for us actually shows us being back close to where we were in 2019 in 2021. So this year we expect to be back on sales tax levels that we were at in 2019, which is a really good thing. Um, much better than what was originally forecasted. And then there's about a five or 6% growth going forward. Um, they may want to, well, we'll get a, a March forecast for, from them to see you know, what it looks like with more current data. Um, but yeah, that we expect that to be certainly helpful. The big issue is then, then going to be um, the fares that have been reduced by half. So there's about 70, 80 million dollars tied up in the lost ridership. Okay, thank you. I had a question. Just to understand the run boards, is the 30 million the increment of um, lost service that was cut or does a bigger chunk and is the 30 million an average so it's likely to be smaller going forward and maybe larger at the other end or are there potential additional dollars available in that 180 million depending on what happens i'll take that question and elise you're absolutely right it's an assumption we're making going forward so as we gear up and we look at what's happening as i indicated looking at data from the you know apcs and things of the like and getting feedback this will give us an ability to make adjustments and when we looked at it holistically looking at the full roll up we designated those amounts. So there could be a period in time where we use a little less or we use a little bit more going forward contingent upon what's happening in the environment. So depending on that, I'm just wondering whether or not as that fluctuates, particularly as I assume it'll ramp up, there might be some of those monies that are available to do some of the, the RTD accountability committees um, recommendations related to service and fares and that kind of stuff might be 
there, there's potential for including some of that in there? There is potentially, and I say potentially as we talk about the whole aspect of the intent of those monies so we could do a fund swap, but then considering um, if in fact we do go forward and we're making adjustments, we may get back into the mode of doing recruitment so we have ample um, frontline personnel readily available when you think about our ongoing attrition just by nature. So there could be a mix there. So there's some flexibility with all of that. But yes, your your assumption is correct, but it'll be a balancing act as we go forward. Fair enough. Daya? Thank you, Elise. Um, and thank you for the presentation, Doug and Deborah. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious, the, there was about 13 million that's allocated towards um, implementing recommendations from the Accountability Committee. A lot of the recommendations from the Accountability Committee have also included uh, vaccine distribution and RTD's role in kind of COVID recovery. So I'm curious to know if, if you all, aside from the CRISA funds, are also looking at state dollars to maybe support or supplement some of this, um, some of these costs that RTD might uh, incur as a result of, of some of the recommendations that we may be putting forward. So I'll answer the first part and then yield the floor to Doug. So just in an effort to manage everyone's expectations, that 14 million is not just accountability, but as we go forward, okay, I just wanted to make sure about that um, going forward. So uh, all of that is sort of tied into service delivery when we talk about what we anticipate to do when you talked about the vaccinations and what we may do going, going forward. Um, but I'll ask Doug to speak about uh, any assumptions made about state dollars in, in reference to the costs. Great. Yeah, and we, we haven't assumed any state funding at all uh, going forward. Uh, you know, our policy is really to be as conservative as possible. So until the, the funding, just like we did with Chris, uh, um, General Manager Johnson wanted to wait until we had specific guidance on that to see what we could use it for because we didn't want to say, you know, we wanted to make sure that the money was virtually in, po in our pockets before we started spending it um in our minds so um no we haven't received any notice of state funding um one of the things i would point out that um in the state performance audit report um last time we went through negotiations with the union um a lot of the working conditions are a big portion of that and you know there's significant costs tied to things like um, rest breaks uh, just due to the nature of the way that we put our routes together um oftentimes it you know, if we change anything, it, it requires additional human resources, additional buses, um, just like we have with the uh, the um, the additional buses to ensure social distancing. So those usually, you know, can amount to significant costs very quickly. So I would just point that out too. So for $14 million, $13 million sounds like quite a bit, but I think depending on how it gets used, it could get used quickly. I think Jackie has her hand up. Yes, thanks, Elise, and thanks, everybody. I um, I had a question about, um, first of all, the, the financial picture. That is much brighter than what we are seeing in our uh, financial projections. Uh, we're not looking at getting back to uh, 2019 levels of sales and use tax for at least 2020, and, and we're thinking, excuse me, 2022, and we're thinking that's a little bit aggressive. That's one question or one comment, and I know you are required to use uh, the projections, but I guess I'm, can you be conservative uh, and, and look at the lower end as you as you budget? I'm just curious about that question, what the requirements are for RTD. And then the other question is, um, given the fact that, that this funding is coming in, is there a way to use it to drive ridership? And I'm not, quite sure how, but are you exploring how, since you are able to return some of the employees, some of the workforce back, uh, is there a way to look at how uh, you can leverage this period to increase ridership at a lower cost to the riders uh, since you're getting this supplemental funding? Thanks. Deborah, do you want to take the ridership portion of that? Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Mayor Malay, for your question. So as we talk about utilizing any types of funds of driving ridership, recognizing the intent of the CRISA funds was purely about transit operations, we would have to look at doing a swap. Now, keeping in mind that we could be a victim of our own success, because getting back to what Doug said in his earlier response, if we leverage programs, we have to put out more vehicles to 
um, decreased headways, then we're talking about a full roll up of adding additional vehicles to a block, which could in turn cause more financial expenditures due to the fact we're talking about, you know, that mechanic that's ensuring that bus is in a state of good repair, the cleaning crew and the supervisory staff and those in dispatch. So as we go forward looking at to as we go forward looking to increase ridership, there's going to be additional costs attributed to that. So as we look holistically about what we wanna do, this gets back to the earlier questions where we have to ensure that we're able to gear up in such a way and have adequate resources, i.e. frontline operation staff, not just operators, but the whole kit and caboodle. So as we look at this going forward, we're leveraging some smaller pilots. That's our intent that we've talked about but recognizing that we have to ensure that this is sustainable because if we put out that we have, just for argument's sake, you know, some easy, fair, and I say easy in the sense that it's not very uh, complex that anybody could basically grasp, and we go out and put that forward, and then we're missing service because of our standard attrition rate, we would be destined for failure. So all of this has to be taken into consideration. So that's a long-winded answer, but it's, it's not a simple one to address. So Doug, the other portion. Thank you, sure. Yeah, and we've seen that too. So even though um, RTD sales and use taxes in 2020 were down about 4%, just over 4%, um, city and county of Denver, their sales taxes are down 10%, a little over 10%. We believe that the, um, the main reason for that is that uh, we have a more broad-based sales and use tax um, base than individual counties and cities. So for instance, we've seen a huge shift uh, where new sales of cars or car, car sales for new cars, um, sales taxes on those as well as restaurants used to be our number one and number two. Those have fallen down into two and third, second and third slots and internet sales are our number one. So, when, you know, just comparing to city and county of Denver, um, they typically don't have a lot of car sales. Um, we have a lot of malls um, within our district that city and county of Denver doesn't necessarily have. So it's a little bit different situation. They also are a home rule, um, as I would guess, uh, Lone Tree is too, to a certain extent, where they, where we have differences in what we have as taxable items, non-taxable items. So um, there's some significant differences there, but we um, have been very fortunate to only have a 4% drop in our sales and use taxes. Thanks for that. Rebecca, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just had a, a question about timing. Um, as I appreciate that the, you all are looking at that 13.9 million for the um, some of the audit findings as well as for the recommendations from this committee. And Doug, you mentioned that the audit um, needs could be significant. When when is RTD going to make a recommendation on on how to allocate those dollars specifically that 13.9? I'll take the first portion of that, Rebecca. Recognizing that we are leveraging the American Public Transportation Association to engage in a peer review, that's going to kick off in March. And basically, what we anticipate them doing is looking, the scope basically is what came out of the audit, more specifically what we can do with our auditing function. So recognizing that could take anywhere between, you know, six to eight weeks. Um, we're looking at the May-June timeframe as we go forward and what Doug did reference that we're going to have a service change in June. We were able to partner with the union to adjust that so we could do some feedback relative to what might be optimal, recognizing that we had a service change in January, but then we're bringing individuals back. We want to ensure that we're putting them um, to work in the sense of, you know, uh, doing the uh, relays and what a relay is, let me use the right language here so everybody understands, is very analogous to running a race. If in fact you have a bus that's out there and then basically you need somebody to pick up additional people, that bus will be deployed. So all of those things coming down the pike will happen in this interim period. And then as we look at J June, getting back on track by having the full complement so these individuals could bid on work whereby we adjust so we have the appropriate headways for where we are going. Did that makes sense? Okay. And so that's what we anticipate. So that long-winded answer would be like in the late, you know, April, early May timeframe as we look at what it is we're doing, because then we would have to have a bid prior to effectuating that service change in June. 
Okay. I think I'm following. Um, okay. Do you think prior to that, that there'd be ability to identify a smaller amount of dollars that could go towards some of the recommendations from this committee? I am optimistic, yes. So what we would do, and Doug could speak more specifically to this, considering that we have these dollars earmarked for salaries and things like that, then the monies that we basically projected or budgeted to use for salaries, now that we have this, that could supplement that so we could release that hold on those other dollars that we have greater flexibility with outside of the CRISA funds. Did I lose you? You lost me. Okay, so what <laughs> I'm saying, Rebecca, is that recognizing that we didn't uh, plan for this CRISA money and mm -hmm. that we had to ensure that we could play employees, now that we have the CRISA money that could be I used gotcha. for that, we can relinquish those dollars that we have greater flexibility on for things such as the recommendations. Okay. 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 So we'll, we sort of need to move on. I guess I just want to make one comment. I, I really appreciate, um, you know, the honesty and frankness about having to um, be realistic about the costs of um, pro providing service. But I guess w when I look at sort of the, some of the basis for the distrust and the disappointment in the old RTD, which I'll refer to as pre Deborah. One of it is that the perception is that here we have our premier transit agency in Colorado that was afraid of increasing ridership. And the sole purpose of having RTD in the metro region is to get as many people on transit as possible. So recognize that when you talk about, gee, we don't want to increase ridership too much, that really um, is counter to what everybody else thinks because we want to collectively as a society in denver put as many people on transit as possible and if the answer is yes we do too but we need more money then let's hear what that dollar figure is mm -hmm. but saying that we don't want to increase ridership and we want to be cautious is counter to the entire purpose of this committee so i just wanted to make that comment gently but just wanted you to know how your your comments were falling at least for me so. Okay. No, I totally appreciate that. I, I totally do. And that's not my intent. My intent is to manage expectations as we go forward. So we're not in the same precarious position we were back in 2018 when you have people standing at bus stops and stations wondering about, oh, the missed service. So that was that was my uh, judiciousness in reference to the comments. So thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I don't question your intentions at all, but I think collectively we want to work with RD to figure out how to maximize ridership. So mm -hmm. anyway, with that, thank you so much for that very, very helpful presentation. Um, we need to move on to then our piece of what our recommendations are to you for that $13.8 million that we'll have to share with the state audit um, committee as well. Um, so Ron, are you going to cue this up? Um, Co-Chair Jones, I am. Let me... Right. So um, I think that's a good transition to um, this topic, which is specific recommendations from the RTD Accountability Committee relating to the use of the coronavirus response and um, relief supplemental appropriations act of 2021 funding. So I won't I'll, I won't repeat a lot of the background information that uh, Deborah and Doug provided to the committee, um, other than. Um, the finance subcommittee in particular has been spending a lot of time uh, reviewing this information and putting putting together uh, these recommendations for RTD to consider. Uh, the finance subcommittee at their last meeting did formally um, recommend um, these to the full committee for consideration. We are asking for a uh, motion uh, to approve the recommendations today from the full committee. Um, the The recommendations really are focused um, on those measures uh, that RTD could uh, consider to use these additional COVID relief funds to help stabilize RTD operations, to restore services, to rebuild trust with stakeholders and constituencies around the region, to attract new and returning riders and position the agency to for strategic recovery from the pandemic. Um, 
Dr. Cog's staff, um, and really um, hats off to Matthew Helfant for all his hard work, uh, did complete a draft equity assessment for the recommendations that are included in the packet uh, for, the, for the committee. Um, I will really briefly summarize the, the specific recommendations. Um, they were in your packet. They really do start with um, a request for um, increased transparency around the process and um, priorities uh, prior setting by RTD for the use of the funds um, to make sure that they clearly define its priorities for the funding and really how their their priorities for funding um, are related to the issues being addressed by the additional funds and the amount of funding allocated to each priority. Um, uh, the recommendation is that that transparency should continue as the funds are spent so that the public can track those expenditures over time. Uh, the second recommendation relates to recalling previously laid off frontline employees. You can see some uh, alignment between the recommendations from the committee and what RTD is already looking at doing. Um, also, um, RTD should um, explain the amount of the funding needed to recall the workers and what amount of funding is available for additional priorities. Um, I think you've started to do that. The third recommendation is about sharing federal stimulus funding with other transit service providers in the area, in the metro area. Uh, there are other, there are nonprofit and community-based transit service providers in RTD district. They also have been significantly impacted by uh, the pandemic, but provide really important um, transit services in partnership with RTD. Um, the fourth recommendation is to implement a reduced flat fare uh, in a pilot for six months to help rebuild and attract, rebuild ridership and attract new riders to the system. Um, really, this is a way to market uh, this pilot program as a simple and affordable and easy to understand way uh, for folks to ride RTD and try to attract uh, those returning riders as uh, demand increases. The fifth recommendation is to work to improve the um, uptake and the ease of use for the existing PASP programs that RTD has in place, uh, particularly focused on uh, flexibility in the EcoPass programs um, and helping, helping find ways to um, help folks um, enroll in and take advantage of the LIV, um, LIV program uh, that RTD has in place. The sixth recommendation is to offer free RTD parking and transit day pass benefits to folks traveling to a COVID vaccination facility for either their primary or their second dose shot. Again, trying to position RTD as an important player in helping people access and uh, access vaccinations and um, spread uh, the vaccination uh, to the population. Related to that is uh, the seventh recommendation, which is would be a trial ridership program by offering temporary free RTD rail or bus service to anyone receiving a COVID vaccination. So that would be uh, for uh, 15 to 30 days. Uh, again, helping helping people access vaccination, vaccinations, but also tying sort of and encouraging people to, to get their vaccination through um, an ability to uh, ride RTD and really trying to make sure that we're getting people back on the system. Um, finally, um, the eighth, the last recommendation is to look for opportunities to develop and expand um, new partnerships or existing partnerships uh, in the RTD system. There's a series of um, examples that are provided uh, that the committee felt that RTD should particularly look at, partnerships with uh, new job centers, uh, looking at some of the existing community and nonprofit based um, uh, services that are provided in some communities and looking at ways to expand those, uh, merging different flex ride service uh, boundaries into uh, larger areas and um, looking for partnerships, for instance, with CDOT on ways to pursue grant funding uh, for important corridor improvements. Uh, with that very brief summary, um, Co-Chair Jones, happy to entertain any questions um, or discussion on the part of the committee. Uh, we do have a recommended motion uh, to adopt the recommendations to RTD, um, and again, this would this this recommendation would kick off the formal 45-day review and response period uh, from R from RTD to these recommendations. Thanks for that, Ron. Rut, do you have a question? I, I did have a comment uh, that I wanted to make on this. 
you know, this goes back to the issue of ridership. And uh, a lot of these things are really oriented uh, towards driving ridership. But it's also oriented towards getting people to take vaccinations. Uh, because ultimately, if you look at RTD situation, until we get to a point of herd immunity or something approaching that, uh, we're going to continue to have pretty severe limitations that are going to increase cost for RTD. And so the more we can do to get the vaccinations uh, going, the better off we'll be. Some of the partnerships that we talk about and the importance of those is those may actually drive funding into RTD for greater ridership. Uh, because it isn't just about doing more services, it's also about partnering with cities and towns and nonprofits and a whole lot of other things in order to be able to, to accomplish some of those goals. So I think, I think when you look through these things, you'll see that uh, some of them are things that RTD is already doing already. Uh, some of these are about issues like accountability. Uh, but a lot of them are really about driving ridership. And ridership is how you measure a transit agency. If, if we're not moving people, then we're not justifying our existence. So that's a, a really big part of the proposal. Thanks, Rhett. Other comments or questions? Dan. Bye. I think Julie was ahead of me. Oh, you guys be vigorous with your hand raising. <laughs> Ju Sorry, Julie, I should have been bigger. Okay, so um, what I really just wanted to say is um, I appreciate that uh, there's a recommendation in here about helping um, provide transit for folks who are um, going to get their first or second dose for the COVID vaccination. I think that's really important for a number of reasons, um, mainly because we are seeing huge disparities in um, folks who have the ability to access the vaccine. Um, and so transportation is one of those um, large barriers that folks are, are seeing, not to mention, um, you know, access in your local neighborhood and things like that. But um, I, I do appreciate that that recommendation was put forward because it, we do have a, a, a large disparity in, in COVID vaccination that unfortunately we're seeing in our community. So just a comment, thanks. Thanks, Julie. Dan? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess what I want to want to say is that uh, this group, uh, I think, is very well intentioned and they recognize the need for RTD to, you know, grow its ridership and get back to pre-pandemic levels at some point in time in the future. Um, I would say as you know, a transit provider that it's really challenging providing transit services right now with COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 is not just something that affects transit systems, it's affecting the globe. And, uh, and so everything that you do to try to increase ridership during this time frame uh, has to be counterbalanced with the safety of your employees and your ability to actually deliver those services in a way that responds to community needs and is convenient and so forth. So I just want to support the RTD staff here and uh, General Manager Deborah Johnson because I know she would like nothing better than to have standing room only on all of her buses, but she can't do it because the Department of Health would give her citations if she did uh, because she wouldn't be uh, abiding by social distancing requirements. Uh, so it's it's not that. I don't think, you know, it's not that I think that, that RTD doesn't want to build ridership or what have you. It's just really a matter of timing. It has to be done thoughtfully and she needs to have the resources and the, and the personnel and the equipment and so forth to do it because to get back to 100% of what they were providing in terms of ridership prior to the pandemic, she would need about 150% of the people and the vehicles that she has in order to do it. So uh, what I thought I took away from our finance committee meeting was these are recommendations that we're giving them and RTD would use its best judgment to implement some of these recommendations when it made sense to do so. Thank you. Yeah, let me just say something and then Rhett, I'll turn to you to respond as well. I think you're right, Dan. Um, 
absolutely. And I think the, the recommendations are offered in a supportive fashion, recognizing, I mean, there's more recommendations than there is money, for sure. That is that is our co committee's way. We have a lot of ideas and RTD is going to have to pick and choose. And you're absolutely right um, about ridership. It is a matter of timing. And while we want to encourage it, um, we recognize that there's a sweet spot that increasing ridership will uh, will occur as we increase vaccination and get through COVID and, and some of Rudd's great recommendations related to vaccinations is, uh, I think, really reflective of that understanding that the faster we increase vaccinations, the more we can increase ridership. And I guess I'd just add one other comment, since I was the one that brought up, you know, the being really supportive of increasing ridership is that there's also an important discussion happening in the Capitol right now around transportation funding and the need for that to reflect the state's climate roadmap, which means that the, a good chunk of that funding, if not the majority of it, should go to mobility that is um, low emissions mobility, which means uh, transit and bike pad and, and the like. And so I think we collectively also need to think about shaping that conversation in the capital so that transit agencies are reaping the benefits of this need to get um, single occupancy vehicle replaced by things like transit. And that, my comments about ridership, I think, are have to do with capturing some of those revenues that are pointing towards these public benefits. And RTD should be re re the recipient of some of that in my mind. Rhett, you had some comments? I did. I, I do want to emphasize one other thing in this, which is something Elise always reminds me of, is that uh, it's important when the whole committees and all of the committees are thinking through the recommendations they want to make. This isn't just about the COVID environment that we're in right now. We also have to be thinking beyond COVID as to the things that may have a very positive impact on RTD, because hopefully you know, we will eventually reach a period when when we defeat this thing. Uh, and there are a lot of opinions on when that may happen, but it will, th this is, I think, not gonna be a forever situation where we're, where we're dealing with social distancing as we are now. And when that happens, boy, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to really go after ridership hard. Great, Lynn? Lynn, you're, you're muted. muted. And you're still muted. Wow. Um, can we unmute Lynn? You can text it to me and I'll read it out loud. I'm not sure how yeah. to overcome yeah. our techn technology barriers today. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to start trying to move us towards, are there any um, if anybody's recommending any changes, otherwise we'll look for a motion. Crystal? It, um, sorry to clarify, not a change, but a question. Are we going to vote on these as a package or individually? I think we're going to vote on them as a package, um, recognizing that they're sort of a menu of options um, that, that we're giving to RTD. and. Um, Unless somebody seriously objects to something on the list, I don't think we are in a position to um, sort of uh, prioritize or suggest that's exactly what RTD does. They're just recommendations. Thank you for that clarification. Rhett? I would, however, encourage anyone who has concerns about a specific recommendation to speak out because it could be that we identify some that we want to vote on individually. But I think for the most part, you know, given the time constraints that we're under, it's going to be hard to go through each one of these individually. Uh, also, also I, did, I did want to mention that the, all of these have been reviewed in, in terms of equity in some detail. And they're really, in, in my evaluation of those comments, there wasn't much that that was uh, uh, of concern with regard to equity. For the most part, almost all of these recommendations will have a, a larger impact on low-income people, for example, and minorities and other, other communities that fall into that category. Crystal. 
Thank you. Um, you know, I didn't have a specific issue with one recommendation or another. You know, it's kind of hard to, um, you know, if you haven't been part of every meeting to really understand the the, the true impact. So I guess that was more my uh, hesitation and as it relates kind of just generally to um, how we've applied the equity assessment. This is actually something I was hoping to bring up at some point, um, but we'll kind of continue conversations after today. But, um, you know, it, it, it occurred to me that it's the groups, you know, like, like we are almost like auditing ourselves when it comes to equity impacts. So it almost feels like, you know, just reading through this, like I think we've done the best that we've can, we can, we can given just our subject matter expertise, but it almost feels, uh, you know, and this is me just kind of thinking out loud, um, that it might be worth connecting with folks um, who are better equipped to kind of give a more thorough, uh, equitable, I guess, impact assessment. Um, just, just kind of my high level thoughts on that, not necessarily impacting um, the conversation as it relates to the vote, because I do, and thank you, by the way, for making sure that that was complete before our conversation today, just high level, this isn't the only set of recommendations where we have applied this equity lens. So just wanted to kind of air my, just high level just concerns with just the process as the way in which we've applied that equity assessment and potential to kind of improve moving forward. But I didn't have a specific recommendation that I thought was just so, you know, terrible or you know anything negative per se so um, I um, would be okay with um, I guess recommending them as a whole instead of going through them one by one again unless somebody else has any other outstanding concerns. If, if I could make one other comment on that I'd, I'd like to give Matthew Helfand a, a lot of credit for the job that he did on the equity assessment he really I think went through and tore them apart. <laughs> Yes, he's uh, done the other assessment as well. So he's been doing a lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. Uh, just to understand, Crystal, are you suggesting as we go forward and we do equity assessments on our recommendations that we sort of ask for public comment from equity experts on our mm -hmm. assessments? I wasn't sure quite what you were suggesting. You know, that's a good point and, and perhaps something to talk through a little bit more, but um, I just, you know, as as capable as we are as a group to approve them and, and Matt has again put in a lot of work um, here, I, just from a process standpoint, the, the fact that we're like auditing for equity our own recommendation seems like, again, just from a process standpoint, um, I, I don't know, I think that there's that's to me just some, some trepidation on my end. Um, so just, yeah, suggesting that moving forward, we have a process, whether that's, you know, I don't know how much more funding we have available, maybe we specifically outsource, you know, in the way that we've um, used um, North Highlands to do some work for us, maybe they can step in and help us there. Uh, but again, I haven't had a chance to vet with Dr. Cog or with you, um, obviously, as, as co-chair or really with the whole committee, but um, since we're talking about this formal recommendation that would trigger this 45 day kind of response, um, I figured it'd be a good time to bring it up now. Okay, well, so maybe that's something that the, the sort of agenda committee can, can think through whether or not there's Indeed. a process recommendation that we might have for that going forward. In the interest hey, of time, we're kind hey, of- Hey, Elise. Under... Matthew had a comment. Hey, hey Elise. Oh, sorry. This is Jackie. I've been trying to raise my hand. Um, I, I, I just I wanted, have to rely on somebody to tell me because I can't see when you uh, raise your hand. I apologize. Uh, I can't tell that you can't see. So I just oh. wanted to follow up on a um, comment Crystal made. And I thought when we had the discussion of equity at the very beginning, that we were very clear about the fact that we were going to do our best, but any recommendation that RTD moved forward with would have to be viewed under a much more critical lens. And so I guess um, we did our first, I, I guess I am, I am very supportive of moving forward the recommendations. Uh, and I think the, the comments she raised are very important regarding equity, but I think we can only do so much with the limited time and money that we have. And I guess my comfort was taken in the fact that before anything would be formally adopted or changes made, um, that there would be a more thorough equity analysis done. So I guess I, I don't, in the interest of time, I, I kind of like us moving forward along this path, acknowledging this is a first brush at the equity and that we need a deeper dive, but that that 
with the funding and timing, we're not in, in the position to do it. So anyway, with that, I think I heard Crystal make a recommendation to improve all of them. And I would just like to second that. Crystal? Thank you. Um, and thank you for the, yeah, I guess it was a formal <laughs> recommendation. Um, just to add some nuance, um, my thoughts on the the recommendation then to not you know take that's not the subject matter of this conversation but i do think it's worth thinking through a little bit more um i guess i'm not satisfied with um understanding i guess we haven't looked into whether or not it's feasible to offer more robust suggestions and um we had a public comment uh this this morning about some kind of back and forth around some of the recommendations right and so um how are we making sure that people understand the recommendations that we um, are proposing? And you know, the equity assessment could help move um, decision making for, for, for the cities, for example, when we're talking about local zoning um, ordinances, um, help inform their decision making. So it's not only just like us doing our best, but I actually think it could be a tool for um, other constituencies and decision-making bodies to support their decision-making process. So just wanted to add a little more substance. But again, we haven't vetted this out. This is just me kind of thinking through this in this in this time. So I appreciate this dialogue. We um, are running out of time. So I, th I think we have time. If we want to move forward with these recommendations today, we have time as we look towards our final report. If there's anything different we want to do about equity assessments with that, so if I could just move us to a vote on these recommendations now, if we're ready. We do have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed? <clears throat> Julie, you're not opposed. Okay, so I think it passes unanimously. Um, thanks to everybody who put so much work into this particularly Rhett uh, leading the finance committee's uh, discussion and Matthew, you know, doing the equity assessment. And uh, with that, I'm going to move to our last agenda item, which is our, our work plan calendar. And I think that's Matthew that's going to walk us through that. Is that true, Matthew? Are you on? because we cannot hear you. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, quick, knowing that uh, we're running out of time. Can you see me? I, I, hear you, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Hello? Okay. How about Speak now? Later. Now? Yes? Now? OK. Sorry about that. Um, knowing that we knowing that we we don't have much time left i uh, just want to say that um all three committees uh all three subcommittees developed work plans uh the, the the work plans were included in the materials and uh just wanted to allow some time for the committee to have a discussion about the work plans knowing that there is some synergy between um some of the topics that uh multiple um uh, subcommittees are, are taking on with that I'll, I'll leave it to conversation amongst the committee Thanks, Matthew. I did have one comment. I felt like an omission that perhaps I should have brought up earlier, um, and it's related to the comments that I made earlier. We don't really have anything that talks about um, sort of the environmental impacts um, or benefits of RTD's work. And in particular, I'm um, thinking about electrification of vehicles. That is a big topic out um, that's being discussed in the legislature, state agencies. There's money potentially available. Um, and again, the, the governor just released his climate roadmap a week or so ago, and this all fits together. And we don't have anything in our recommendations that says anything about that. And I guess I would, I'd like to recommend that we add that. I, I'm not exactly sure where it goes, but my instinct would be operations maybe, sort of, because uh, it's related to sort of vehicles. Um, and it, it doesn't, I don't know if it's a huge uh, area of inquiry so much as uh, I would think that we would have something to say um, about encouraging that given the equity implications of um, air pollution associated with transit operations, particularly in some of our um, 
disproportionately impacted neighborhoods and as well as the climate impacts, which also have an equity standpoint. So just wanted to throw that out there and see where that landed um, in people's opinions. And I see Dea is back. So maybe if you have a comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Elise. Um, I do see it fitting within operations and I'm wondering, and I'm open to folks' feedback, but um, within the work plan, we have ensure sub-regional and regional coordination. So kind of lifting it up as this overarching theme. I don't know if it makes sense there, but um, I do see it potentially living within operations. On the finance piece, I mean, I think exploring some of the longer term funding opportunities from um, state climate uh, opportunities might be worth finance, worth exploring in the finance committee. I think that's a, that's a good point. So maybe there's an interface, both harnessing the dollars associated with that and then the actual um, sort of operational standpoint. I see a thumbs up from Rut. Does anybody have an issue with adding that to the work plan? Seeing none. Other comments, questions, suggestions related to the work plan? Troy. Not not so much to the work plan. Um, just unfortunate we couldn't get the eloquence of, of Lynn um, here. We've been trying to communicate. Um, for some reason, the control panel works for me, not for her. I don't know. That's interesting, but had some platform issues this morning. But one of the things that Lynn had brought up, and I was kind of mulling over, um, uh, and it goes back to a couple of prior conversations, is just the uh, informal actions uh, and and a lot of group discussions and uh, between the board members and with staff, and then upcoming strategic planning sessions that we postponed a bit um, to let Deborah get her feet under herself and and interact with all of you but you know we've had conversations about our fares and Deborah has recognized this and I'd sure let her chime in our fares are high we all know that some of the highest in the country that's got to be addressed and uh, we're we're uh, moving toward toward that direction and obviously um, you know as we recover um, we passed COVID principles. We'll continue to tweak those as things move on. But as you had kind of mentioned, I think Lynn wanted to reiterate. Hopefully, Lynn will nod in acceptance or shake her head violently left to right if I'm misquoting her. Um, you know, it's a chicken egg issue. Um, you know, we want to make the services available, but on the other hand, we have to financially be able to do that. Um, so I think the timing issues on that were were pretty well. Uh, covered by by Deborah on that, but we just wanted to let you know that the board's with you on a lot of these very critical discussion issues, and it will move from discussion to action soon. Is that fair, Lynn? Deborah, anything else you'd like to correct that I messed up there? <laughs> no, thank you so much, Director Whitmore. I think that was spot on. Uh, recognizing what you said. I just want to reiterate, yes, our fair structure is complicated and we have to work in earnest to discern what our path forward is. And I'm open to having those discussions. So thank you. Thank you, General Manager Johnson for that. And uh, Director Whitmore. Other comments or questions on the work plan? I don't know that we need a formal adoption, but more just a heads up that this is the body of work that we are committing to undertake for our final report in July. It also is what we're committing not to undertake. If it's not on that list, we probably won't have time to get to it. So any final last changes or are we good to go with this? Daya? Yes, this is more just a comment um, that I think has been shared in multiple committee meetings, but just for the record for pub, um, so that the public is aware, we recognize that there are, there's certainly a lot of overlap between the committees. And I think one thing that we had talked about um, with the Dr. Cog staff was identifying where are the, the points of conversation overlapping with another committee so that we can have a, a bit of a joint conversation rather than having them in silos. So I just wanna make sure that that's um, something that folks are aware of, that we are, we, we recognize that and we're working towards that. Good point. 
Quick comment, I, I think it'd be useful if our work plans reflect that also, because in, in some of the issues that we've got on, uh, it's like work with the government's governance committee on this. And, and in our case, Daya, it would be working with you on some of the ideas that you want to implement regarding electrification uh, that, that we can provide uh, some ideas on how to finance. So, but if it's on those well, work plans, you tend to do it. <laughs> So maybe a flag for Dr. Cog's staff, in addition to adding the, the electrification climate piece, um, really highlighting where there's overlap, who the lead committee is, and then we'll need to figure out on the calendar when that, if there's a joint discussion, when that happens. Right. Will do. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Jackie, did you have anything? Jackie had to jump off. Okay, sure. I finally recognize her and she's gone. <laughs> um, all right. Well, then it is uh, almost 10 o'clock, so I guess I am ready to wrap things up. Any last final comments, suggestions? Then let me thank everybody for their uh, investment of time and energy in this. This is, I feel really good about being able to put forward recommendations, appreciate very deeply RTD's involvement in the discussions as well as the implementation as we move forward. Um, so thanks for that. And uh, we will uh, see everybody at the subcommittee meetings coming up. Good. So thanks. Have a good one, everyone.